Um, distinguished speakers, dear participants, welcome to the session Culture and Art in Valuing Water. This session is inspired to the World Water Development Report 2021 on valuing water. In particular, we will discuss approaches to incorporate intangible benefits like cultural values into water valuations, so to enhance well-being and good life aspect in societies, which become eventually more resilient. In, um, we will also consider alternative ways like art to actively engage society in water management development, helping reconcile competing water uses and their antagonistic values and acting as peaceful vehicle for social and even political discussion on water issues. Um, dear audience, uh, uh, feel free to use the chat box for comments or questions to the speakers and panelists. Water has always been a source of inspiration for art and brings intangible benefits like spiritual peace and contemplation. Andrew Graham Dixon is one of the leading art critics and presenters of art televisions in the English speaking world and a renowned art journalist and writer. In this short introduction, introduction, he will show us how water has flowed into the arts since the past and how powerful this message has been. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michaela. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And I'll try to make it bigger. Are we all seeing this? Just Thumbs slide. up, everybody can see? Yes. Very good. Okay. So, yes, I, I wanted to begin um, with this wonderful image. This is um, a painting from the wall of an Etruscan tomb. Um, so it's very, very old. It was uncovered near the ancient Greek ruins of Paestum, which is near Pompeii, near Herculaneum, near Naples, on that beautiful coast of Italy. And it's just a wonderful thing. It's a rather mysterious image. Um, archaeologists called it the tomb of the diver. But I wonder if it really is um, the tomb of a diver. I think it is an image of transition, appropriate for a tomb. I think that this wonderful naked figure, a human being in their nakedness, diving down into the water. I think the idea is that they are going to dive into the water of death, the water that is the unknown. And when they penetrate that water, they will emerge somehow at the other end into some kind of idea of a new life. So it's, it's water as the ultimate mystery. It's that which we enter, but we know not where we go. Um, and water has always had this tremendously powerful sense uh, in human beings before we were even scientifically aware. And certainly the painter of this picture was not scientifically aware of evolution and the idea that all life emerges from water, but nonetheless, the notion that water is something from which we emerge and something perhaps to which we return at the moment of our death. This seems to be very common in very many cultures. Um, the idea of transformation and, and death and rebirth through water, I could have also included uh, there's a wonderful video piece by Bill Viola, which lasts for 20 minutes. It's a slowed down image of a man falling into water, which Viola simply called baptism. And this man falls slowly, slowly, slowly into the water, and then he explodes into the water. And it's almost as if this primal moment of being born, being baptized, dying, it's all crystallized in, into this image. Um, and I think it begins, Viola has certainly said that he's been inspired by this famous 
Etruscan image. The idea of water as purity. And this is an image which I'm sure you all know, it's by Botticelli. Um, it was commissioned by a member of the Medici family. Uh, it was a gift to the bride. Uh, and and it, this was the Medici's way of saying to the young lady who was about to marry into the Medici family, thank you for coming to us. Thank you for coming to land. You are pure, you are Venus, you are eternal beauty. You are the eternal feminine. You exist in purity, in your virgin purity, which is represented by the water, the ocean, and you come to land. And when you come to land, you will marry into our family and we will have children. So hence the association with flora, spring, and the winds, the seasons. She represents spring, she represents um, new life, uh, the child that will come to the Medici family as a result of this union, all expressed um, in this in this wonderful image that 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 has a woman coming out of water, and you might you might find Botticelli in parts to this mythological scene a kind of Christian solemnity. She might almost be the Virgin Mary if you look at her face alone, um, and he's taking these this imagery of water as purity from the classical past, but to his audience, Renaissance audience, Christian audience, water would also have been intensely associated with other rites of passage, not just marriage, but baptism. You know, again, water is what you pour on the head of the newborn baby. Water is what brings them into the spiritual new life of Christ. And this applies not only within the Christian religion, but within many other religions. There are these rituals involving water, which in many cultures does not just purify the food that you eat, does not just purify and clean your body, but it also purifies your soul. So water has this tremendously strong spiritual association. This is just one of many images that, that could have been chosen to illustrate that. But on the other hand, coming forward through the centuries um, to this famous image by Jericho, the raft of the Medusa, Jericho felt that things were deeply wrong in his world, in his society. There was injustice, there was racism, there was slavery, there was war. The great wars that Napoleon had engulfed Europe in were just over, and yet he felt that all was not well with the world. And I think this was his way of saying to Europe in about 1818, 1820, that all is not well with our world. We are all together, but we are on a raft at sea. The stormy sea is a symbol of everything that is wrong. It's almost the barometer of when things are wrong in the world. And it's, it's interesting to me, this type of very large history painting, as they were called, it was very, very unusual at that time in history for a white European French artist to include as heroic figures, the figures of black men in, in a picture of this kind. And Jericho did this and he did it so emphatically that he even made a black man at the very apex of this pyramid of hope. These men are hoping to be rescued. This is an image of humanity seeking its salvation on the stormy waters of the world. And this was Jericho's way, I think, of saying that when it comes to global calamity, global catastrophe, we are all together, white and black and any other color of skin you might care to mention, but we are one humanity. And that was Jericho's message, it was an extremely powerful message. And I was talking to a friend of mine recently who has painted a picture inspired by Jericho's draft of the Medusa. And we were talking about how the message of this painting never seems to go away and seems to become intensified with time. And he was saying to me, just personally, he was saying, every time I see one of those images of refugees on a raft, trying to cross the sea, trying to get across the Mediterranean, coming to Greece or to Italy or to wherever they might land up, whether it's England, 
every time he sees one of those makeshift rafts and hears the stories, the terrible stories of the suffering that people undergo on those rafts, he goes back to this painting and he thinks of this painting. He thinks, well, the message is still there. And it's a message about, it's a message about how, in a way, our relationship to ourselves is like our relationship to these stormy seas. Um, but it's, 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 you know, look at this wave here, this powerful wave. I was going to end with some thoughts about, you know, the traditional value that's been placed on water. You know, in Rome, in the past, Rome was a difficult place to get water to, and it had a large population. And in the Renaissance and the Baroque periods, the Roman popes and their administrations, they revived the ancient aqueduct systems that had once been built by the ancient Romans. And each time they brought water to a new quarter of the city, they announced its arrival with a huge fountain. This is Bernini's Fountain of the Four Rivers. Even more famous is the Trevi Fountain. But these great constructions, they might seem grandiose, they might seem almost pompous, but they are also hugely joyous. They are celebrations of the value of water and the bringing of water and the making public of water. You know, they make, and, and the, the Fontana di Trevi is still, look at it today, it's still a huge public attraction. And what these people are looking at, whether they know it or not, the tourists who flock to the Trevi Fountain, what they're celebrating is the universal availability of this water, which was brought here so that everyone could drink it. I was going to close just with some thoughts about some countries closer to where I am here in Britain. Um, this is Vermeer's view of Delft, this wonderful expanse of water under the pewter sky of the North Sea. This is very much not the water of Rome, this is the water of Northern Europe. And what he's celebrating here, I think, is this is an image of peace. This land, the Netherlands, had known war for 80 years, unbroken war, war and catastrophe, famine, disease, disaster, invasion. And through it all, they had persisted. And at the end of it all, what do you have? You have an image of the city, but the city that is surrounded by this peaceful canal system that was such a triumph of, of, of the Dutch society, you know, that they had managed to tame the waters of the sea and they had managed to control the waters that they would drink, that they would use to wash in. And, and it's the water which reflects this perfect peaceful city on this day of perfect peace, which occupies absolute center stage. And to give you another image uh, from Holland during the golden age, there's no water in sight here, but and again, that's the point. A huge amount of effort has been gone to by the, the Dutch during this period to drain the polders of seawater and to make the pastures where crops could grow and where bulls could be raised, meat and corn and food. And so this is a painting that celebrates the triumph of the Dutch over water, that water is not only something to celebrate, it's also something that we need to control, to withstand. I'm thinking of places like Venice, Venice in peril. I'm thinking of places that suffer now from um, water problems, flooding problems caused perhaps by global warming. A lot of these concerns are art. And I'll finish with um, a British artist, John Constable, celebrating the landscape of his youth. This is a, a wonderful picture, sorry for the slide, it's not such great quality, called The Leaping Horse in which we see a horse dragging a boat full of provisions across a canal, an entirely man-made landscape. But it's not a landscape, it's a waterscape. It's a system of canals through which provisions, uh, food will be taken. So in all sorts of ways, whether we're talking absolute spiritual values, whether we're talking Christian baptism, whether we're talking Venus born at sea, whether we're talking the storms of European history and of world wars, water has always been at the center of our ways of finding images for this and perhaps finding images for a way forward 
for ourselves. And this picture is all about a way forward. That horse will leap the stile, the barge will carry on, life will carry on, and water will be at the center of it. I hope I haven't spoken for too long. <laughs> <laughs> wow, how inspirational introduction, a lot of food for thought. <laughs> I would listen it for hours. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. Um, as you clearly showed, um, what a representation in art of all the number of symbolic meanings from spiritual, as you said, uh, religious, social, and even political, uh, political ones. And to this end, I would like to introduce the first panelist, uh, um, Tebaldo Vinciguerra. Uh, Tebaldo serves the Holy See since 2011, working on environmental issues in the light of the social teaching of the Catholic Church. Tebaldo, in all religions, uh, including, of course, the Christian religion, uh, water has a powerful meaning. Pope Francis encyclica Laudato Si insist on the role of culture, spirituality, and education for the care of the common home, that is the earth, the, our planet. How this could apply to value water in a holistic manner? Do you think that art has helped in the past and could still help to convey these messages? Tibaldo, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Michaela and all of you. Can you hear me correctly? Okay, yeah. well, so uh, again, I'm delighted to be with you uh, and uh, the organizers from UNESCO. Thank you for having me in this fascinating panel. Uh, you mentioned the encyclical letter Laudato Si. It is a path in several chapters. And after understanding the problems, uh, threatening of common home and acknowledging the roots of these problems, Pope Francis invites all people of goodwill to an ecological conversion, according to what he describes integral ecology, which encompasses economy, culture, the environment, institutions, gestures of daily life, human ecology, anthropology, and so on. After this, Pope Francis explains, I quote, many things have to change course, but it is we human beings above all who need to change. We lack an awareness of a common origin, of a mutual belonging and of a future to be shared with everyone. This basic awareness would enable the development of a new convictions attitudes and forms of life. A great cultural, spiritual and educational challenge stands before us. It will demand a long path of renewal. So, end quote. Uh, once you decide to change, to improve, to act for good, you need motivation to sustain your commitment for perseverance, culture, religious values, spirituality, educations are essential for this motivation. So the question, I refrain your question, Michaela, can we understand, can we teach our children to understand during our entire life, so here it is also a challenge for continuous education, continuous learning, the value of water, of if I made values of water, so the values according to an integral perspective. So water often is a cost, a bill, scarcity, statistics, but what about what is intangible? Life, peace, and maybe biodiversity. As a believer, water I know is so important. You have said it in Catholic traditions, rituals, and also in other religions, blessings and water cleansing, purification, the baptism, without forgetting the role of water in sacred scripture. Water as a gesture of welcome, offering water to someone else, and the well and the spring as tools for encounter, dialogue, and even marriage, socialization. If water is so important, it shall not be wasted, neglected, or hoarded, hoarded instead of shared and made accessible 
safely to all brothers and sisters. Somehow there is something divine in this issue. If water is a source of life, fonts vitae, as said recently one of our publications, therefore one shall not remain indifferent when water becomes a factor of death because of irresponsible pollution or because of warfare. In such circumstances, somehow very deep human is offended, is infringed. So education and religious values can help and commit to the good. Yet, Michaela, you asked about art. In several occasions, art, and I even mean architecture, has shown, and this was also clearly explained by uh, uh, Andrew Graham Dixon before me, how water can be beautiful and useful. So I dare to say that human creativity matched the design of God in several astonishing projects. But art also introduced water where at first sight it was not so useful. Again, what is intangible, the beauty, the beauty of a baptismal font, of a pool, a historical well, uh, the well of Zamzam, the Muslims, the beauty of a Byzantine icon depicting the baptism of Christ, the mosaico, such as in Monreale, depicting the creation of water or maritime wildlife. So in the middle of our daily life, art is present. Water is beneficial for our common good of our whole society. Beyond laws that may not be good enough, beyond economic profit that may be too narrow, art is here. The carving of never-ending waves on a sarcophagus evoke eternity. Once more, we discuss about life because of water and death. I will conclude inviting art to trigger empathy, compassion, action, solidarity. It could be about nature, about migrants, refugee, war, yes, but art can help us to create bridge between different groups, different cultures in our daily life. So art makes water maybe even more meaningful, touching the human person at his heart, her heart, or brain. That's it. So heart, water, meaningful, compassion, and action. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Teban. It was very insightful. And we, 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 we will take uh, um, immediately <laughs> your, uh, uh, the, the, we catch your ball and, uh, and uh, immediately ask to another, uh, the follower panelist, um, a question that has to do with uh, what you have proposed. Um, Kalud. Kolud Andrew in his introductions has shown a painting evocating a similar to a, a very actual phenomenon, the migration of women and men living in difficult conditions in water scarce regions, crossing the sea like the Mediterranean or walking long distances, eventually transiting in, in, in refugee camps where water and sanitation conditions are often challenging. Um, Kulude, you are a young Palestinian award-winning anthropologist, a photographer, filmmaker, a refugee right advocate, and act as a water and migration focal point at the Mediterranean Youth for Water and Network. So welcome. Um, this is my question. We say that any expression of art is proving to be a powerful science diplomacy tool an alternative way to discuss water and its management in different social contexts and cultural diversities. But do you agree with, with that? Um, how art has contributed in your work related to water in the refugees camp? Can you answer to Tebaldo? Thank you. Thank you, Michaela, and thank you for allowing me to be part of this interesting panel. 
I do agree to the statement. And I think when we talk in general about refugee camps, especially in the context of water scarcity, images that come to mind are like this one. Um, in I hope you can put the first slide on. Um, of children searching for water or living in challenging conditions. However, despite the conditions refugees face, their daily lives are site for much creativity, including artistic activity, artistic activities that play an important and although often overlooked role um, in the lives of refugees. First, as a form of cultural expression that is connected with refugees' basic human rights, and also as, um, as a helpful tool in achieving political, educational, humanitarian, and collaborative ends. Within my work in Palestinian refugee camps, I saw how young refugees use different forms of art, such as music, photography, storytelling, and graffiti as forms of expression and awareness to many issues, including water. A painted mural at the entrance of Ida refugee camp in the next slide, where I grew up, for example, shows the symbolic importance of women and water in Palestine. The center of the mural is the woman wearing a traditional Palestinian dress, carrying a water jar in her head, and underneath her head cover extends to form a tent sheltering three children. The woman is the protector, and her role as the provider of life is symbolized by the water jar and a significant and the significance of water here is also a symbol of life. Art can also be used as a way to communicate the humanitarian plight of refugees and of solidarity that exceeds the boundaries of language, time, and space. In the next slide, we see, we see a painting of Palestinian artist Ismail Shamut titled A Sip of Water. The artist shows the barefoot refugees desperate for the last remnant of sustenance. As one man strains to hold back the thirsty crowd, a woman gulps from the container while children surround her reach, reaching for a sip. The painting de depicts the harsh lives of refugees and arguably functions as a reminder of refugees' basic human rights symbolized here by water and also bringing to mind these images of refugees and migrants fleeing in the sea. Refugees also use art to challenge the stereotypes about them being passive and needy individuals with nothing to contribute, but as active creative agents, despite the, the adverse conditions of their experiences and the difficult circumstances of their daily lives in the camps. Within my work, I witnessed many refugee-driven initiatives to rebuild and reclaim agency using artistic expression and at the same time as a medium for education and awareness raising. Um, I also saw how art can be used as a medium for collaboration that transcends man-made man boundaries. For example, in the next slide, we see this mural for, from Zaatari refugee camp in Jordan, which was the fruit of collaboration between Syrian refugees, Jordanian and international artists and educators. Though art, through art making, children at the camp were engaged in learning about water conservation, hygiene issues in the camp, their longing to return to Syria, their dreams for the future, and their plight as refugees. The children had the opportunity in such a project to participate and add their own creativity to the, the lesson about water in these images. And um, if you look closer, you can see their words written on top of this mural, such as water is life, water is a treasure, and save water. Uh, next, artistic activity is already being used broadly as a means for achieving human and humanitarian ends. Within the context of water art, it can further play a crucial role in the overall well-being of refugees, affecting the chances of physical, emotional, and educational development, as well as connecting generations and investing in indigenous knowledge. For instance, I'm currently working on a in, in a project in which I collect songs about water from Palestinian refugee women who are over 70 years old, and then reintroduce them to younger generations of refugees in order to keep this water heritage that is connected to Palestinian music alive. To conclude, I think projects, programs, and policies for and with refugee communities should incorporate artistic activity that is based on an approach that is collaborative, coordinated, and consistent. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Thank you, Kulu. That is, uh, this, uh, this is uh, very good to, to listen to that you share your perspective and also your impressive uh, experience uh, that uh, we can see from, uh, from the images that you share with us. Um, I, I would like to turn uh, um, the same questions to Natalia Glovaka because uh, you have something in common with the other panelists. Um, Natalia is uh, both a scientist and artist, and for this reason, she has decided to use both the disciplines in her work. Natalia uh, has a PhD and serves as an environmental project manager uh, in Slovakia. She collaborates with the Joint Research Center of the Re European Commission for the Development of the Water and Art Diplomacy Approach. So this is interesting. We want to know about the diplomacy approach on water and art. Natalia, do you think that we can improve the current uh, water valuation paradigm with the help of the arts and the artist? In other words, do you think that uh, using an approach involving art in water science and management, as also the other panelists have said, can trigger, that then really trigger a behavior change in the societies and hence policy changes in the way water is governed? Thank okay. you very much. Uh, yes, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Mm. Let me just go to the beginning. Uh, can you hear me well? Can you see the presentation? Yes. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure to take a part in this fantastic event. Thank you so much for, for the invitation. Uh, my name is Natalia Głowatka and I will tell you more about science and art, what our diplomacy concept and I will try to answer uh, the question raised by Michaela. Uh, in 2015, within the context of the new science and art water diplomacy concept, we initiated by uh, the Horizon 2020 project Blue Cities, uh, the art competition where local female school pupils from Spain, Turkey, Israel, Romania, United Kingdom and Jordan illustrated how they perceive water. The competition involved school children from different social backgrounds, also girls from, from the refugee camps, but all started in Amman in Jordan, where under the leadership of the Greater Amman Municipality and Jordan SMEs, uh, we initiated the first school prize uh, in Jordan, reaching a wide community of both female university students and uh, female school children. Students from different uh, schools, also victims of the Syrian refugee crisis, uh, have been asked by us to consider uh, the water problems facing their region. As the next step, we organized the art exhibition called Water Seen Through the Eyes of Jordanian Children, uh, which was open under the patronage of the Minister of Education of Jordan and the, Europe the European Commission Joint Research Center. Uh, paintings and drawings were presented together with uh, seven abstract water cycle paintings created by myself uh, in order to bridge, uh, to build the bridge between technology and one's imagination, between the social and background reality and cultural expression. The exhibition was the invitation to contemplate uh, their artwork and to understand the message which our children are giving us. So we may uh, learn more how, how to work more on the ecologically sustainable future. The exhibition highlighted the unifying power of water. It showed that we all live and see water in the same way, regardless of our nationality, culture and social status. Artwork made by children uh, was included into the Urban Water Atlas for Europe, a publication from the European Commission, um, where the drawing of the girl from Turkey who won the competition was placed on the cover of, the, of that publication. Urban Water Atlas for Europe shows the original overview of the urban water management in Europe and not only uh, explaining and illustrating water and reflecting how water flows through arteries of our cities. Uh, leading experts in water have joined artists and children uh, in, in, um, in order to show uh, how thirsty our cities really are and how we can cope with the growing demand. 
The Atlas presents 40 cities in 30 different countries and helps the municipalities to, co to confront um, one of the greatest global challenges in local solutions in order to ensure a supply of water. The Jordanian experience was crucial for the development of the science and art water diplomacy contest, a con a concept. Uh, through the art, we managed to engage with local female school kids. We managed upon this experience also to create a kind of uh, dialogue uh, between other school kids, thus transforming water into a kind of dialogue and communication rather than a conflict or confrontation. And now from this experience uh, invented by Richard Ellelman from Project Blue Cities and Bern Gavlik from European Commission Joint Research Center, now we are building even a wider experience on water, energy, food ecosystem nexus in collaboration with the Union for the Mediterranean, um, where the publication will be responsible for the development of the Medusa Nexus, which will address the connection between gen gender and sustainability by thematizing the role of innovation uh, through female-led knowledge and talents often seen as a menace rather than opportunity. The Medusa Nexus will bring the unused potential of female intuition and innovation necessary uh, for change. Thank you, for Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, also uh, answering uh, the question raised by, by Michaela, I, I don't know if I still have a time. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, uh, Natalia. And uh, thank you very much for your, uh, um, for your intervention and for sharing this, this uh, really interesting and original project. And we look forward to, to hearing more about the, the the uh, Medusa project. Okay, so uh, it is clear that water and culture are inseparable elements of human life. The way water is used and valued constitutes an integral part of society's cultural identities. It encompasses lifestyles, value systems, traditions, and beliefs. So to get inspired, um, to, by this concept, uh, I propose to watch a video, a very short video. I don't know if we have still time for this. Um, let's see if my colleagues... Uh, Miguel, and yes, I would suggest to move the video at the very end of the event, if we still have time. All okay. right. We skip the video. All right. For now, yes. All right, very good. So we just uh, go to the next uh, speaker, to the next panelist, who is uh, Nupur. Nupur, uh, welcome. Nupur Protikana, um, she is an international board member of ECOMOS and vice president for Asia Pacific of the International Scientific Committee on Water and Heritage. Based out of Stockholm, she is a landscape consultant on water project in Asia. Um, uh, Nupur, um, Andrew showed uh, beautiful paintings uh, uh, regarding the, you know, the, 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 the water management also in the past in different, in different contests from the, you know, the city to, uh, to the, 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 the landscape and the countryside close to the rivers. Um, do you think that a better understanding of our heritage can help us to address water-related challenges of our future? How we can concretely uh, value water as an integral part of a social cultural identity? Thank you, Michaela, for having me on this panel and thank you to CV and uh, UNESCO for really this, this ultimately come to valuing of water because I've been uh, associated with the World Water Week since 2017, waiting for this moment. So the moment has arrived and we are talking about culture and we're talking about valuing water through a cultural perspective. So thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. So uh, if I was to finish this in uh, two seconds, my answer would be uh, uh, yes to your question. Uh, I would say that uh, I have been talking now about the report card of all of us professionals engaging in the water sector and what the reality around us is. And I always take this report card very seriously. 
So uh, I run an organization called ICOMOS. I'm on the international board. Uh, we look at heritage in, in various perspectives. And today, in the next few minutes, probably four minutes now, I'll be talking about uh, a little bit of what, what we do and why we feel that we need to look into the past to move into our future. Okay, so uh, I find that uh, very often in countries such as India, I'm going to now just pick out one of my favorite pictures from one of uh, the, you know, it's, it's a very common site where uh, there are women worshiping water. Uh, they, are, they are doing their prayers. These are festivities. It could be every morning. It could be worshiping sun, early morning sun. This is actually in the capital city of Delhi uh, during one of the major festivals. And after working with water for many, many years and you know, clicking many such photographs, I asked myself a question It was, asked by a very uh, famous professor saying, why has environmental decline been so pronounced in Asia if we actually promote environmental responsibility? If the whole, you know, our religions, our traditions, our cultural practices are so much about conserving water, how come it's these very nations that are suffering the most? And it was this question which I've been tackling for the last uh, almost seven years now. While tackling this question, uh, I started, uh, and also working very closely with cultural heritage, I started looking at rays of hope around our environment. Uh, this is one very small project in a, a remote part of uh, one state of uh, Punjab where the religious communities of the Sikhs decided to do something about the pollution and about uh, mixing sewerage and water and a lot of issues. And they took it upon themselves, the community, actually look at what solutions they could find. This ray of hope uh, actually brings me to the main point today, which is that if we are really wanting to make a difference on the ground, if we really want to see the innovation that so many uh, wiz wizards, uh, part of uh, this World Water Week, talk about the water innovation, technology, and so much, we need to pivot it in the cultural context. We need to pivot it in our water wisdom, in our heritage. We need to pivot all the solutions we are proposing into what the community has respected, understood, practiced over generations, centuries, decades. Because where the problem lies today is probably this disconnect. This disconnect between what the community understands as important and now I'm seeing this disconnect further in the community itself because it's gone on for so many, uh, you know, it's, it's a few generations now that have been disconnected that if we actually take the traditional water wisdom, we take into account what the natural basis is, we take into account nature culture linkages, how we understand water is about landscape. Water follows gravity. You know, water I feel is a very common sensical solution. It, any time there are water problems, you know that the problem is very basic. So if we are going to actually look at solutions, which in this next decade are going to make a difference, we need to go back and see that what is it that particular community holds sacred? What is it that particular community connects with? I want to end with the bit where, what is it that we are doing? So within ICOMOS, uh, we are actually now looking at, uh, you know, we've set up an international scientific committee on water and heritage, realizing that we are, have to be taken seriously with what we do to really bridge, cross, collaborate with technology, with, with people who are looking at innovation. We need to help everyone look back, to look forward. Uh, we are working very hard bringing cultural values onto the UN water agenda in 2023 in New York at the UN Water Decade Midterm Review. So we're doing a lot of things which are looking forward. But remember, the next, uh, the next uh, uh, session we have, the word heritage needs to also make a beginning, make a, an end into our sessions, into our conversations. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. Thank you, Anupur. Thank you for, uh, for your uh, contribution. 
And actually, uh, you remind me when you said uh, um, uh, water followed gravity. Uh, it reminded me uh, years ago when I, many years ago, when I was young working in, uh, in, in Latin America and Central America, and there was uh, a people from the countries working with me and uh, a campesino told me, uh, you know, um, doctora, uh, el agua siempre va por abajo, nunca por arriba. It goes, the water goes always down, never up. And this is, uh, you know, popular, popular wisdom. Um, but it is, it is very true. And we have to, uh, to, to consider it really a, a wisdom to, to keep and to bring with us. Um, now we have the last speaker. Um, Heriberto Eulisse. Heriberto is the executive director of the Global Network of Water Museums, a flagship in initiative of the UNESCO IHP aimed at promoting water sustainability education and water awareness worldwide. Heriberto works at the Cafo Scali University of, water of Venice for the UNESCO chair water heritage and sustainability. And he is the director of the NGO Civiltà dell'Acqua International Center. Heriberto, uh, water museums. What exactly is a water museum? And what is role in valuing water and in contributing to build a new water culture? Heriberto. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michela, for inviting me to this interesting session. Um, I will try to answer to uh, this question, uh, focusing first uh, on the notion of heritage uh, rather than a museum. Um, if we want to understand why we need to protect a specific uh, water heritage, why we need to promote it, through water museums, we should focus first on this very important notion. And I'm grateful also to the previous speakers because they uh, focused on different uh, practical examples, also giving uh, ethical perspectives about uh, uh, the value of water. So we, we, we saw beautiful uh, examples of uh, fine arts, of uh, architecture, of uh, archeological sites, monuments, and fountains, but uh, in the notion of heritage, we should also include and take into account um, what I would like to term as a minor heritage. The heritage of water artifacts, very often are silent water artifacts, but uh, uh, um, artifacts that brings a lot of values. A lot of values that are shared by communities and that the artifact in itself is not representative, doesn't speak in itself, the artifact. So in this, um, uh, with this approach uh, concerning heritage, including also um, uh, minor heritage, uh, we can better understand uh, the value of art and the importance of intangible values attached to specific material culture. Uh, this perspective uh, recalls also the UNESCO conventions on 2003 and 2005 concerning intangible heritage and the promotion of uh, uh, the diversity of cultures and in a way um, um, broadens our perspective and uh, place history at the very center of the debate about intangible values water histories, the different water histories that uh, museums, in a sense, should try to capture, uh, exhibit, and transmit to future generation. So um, water history and the memory of water are very much connected. And uh, among water museums, today we can include uh, archeological museums, uh, science museums, history museums. We have different examples of museums that uh, try to um, convey the meaning of water, not only exhibiting artifacts, but conveying also what is the value of social practices associated to water. 
So water museums today, thanks to um, a recent uh, resolution adopted by the uh, Intergovernmental Hydrological Program of UNESCO, IHP, um, is also linked to a global initiative, a global network of water museums. This global network of water museums that I represent includes today more than 60 water museums. And the, uh, the title of the UNESCO resolution um, relates uh, to um, the synergies that is important to create with the water museums in order to improve water management through communication and education activities. So this is in a sense, uh, the mission of the global network of water museums and what we, what we are doing. What we are doing is trying to always connect these two sides of the same coin. Um, fine arts, the important uh, expressions of uh, high uh, of fine arts, and at the same level, uh, the forgotten history of water. That history of water, which includes also the perspective of many small scale societies all over the world, but also the forgotten uh, history of water in so-called developed societies. All these aspects um, should be studied, should be promoted. And this is also one of the mission of the global network to try to coordinate the different water museums in um, um, transmitting this important heritage. So uh, places are very often associated to values. And in this sense, it is important also to protect places against uh, pollution, against the degradation to keep uh, alive um, the living heritage of water, what we call living waters. And this is again, uh, another um, uh, perspective that the Global Network of Water Museums is trying to stress the living heritage of water. So the Global Network of Water Museums with this perspective and different approaches, try to build what we can call a new culture of water, a new culture of water that uh, nevertheless cannot forget the past, the, different, the complexity of histories of the past, not only one history, also the approaches of indigenous people, for example, which are examples of uh, living water heritage. And in this sense, I would like to conclude the quoting uh, the charter of the Global Network of Water Museum, for which uh, we should build, first of all, a new relationship between humanity and water. As it, it was also recalled by the first speaker, um, Tebaldo Vinci Guerra, uh, we need a, a strong ethical perspective, which possibly the Pope Francis today is, is one of the few spiritual leaders also trying to convey this deep sense of uh, water values. And in this frame, in our charter, uh, the sense of a civilization that the Global Network of Water Museum tries to promote, reconnect people and water in all its dimensions, including social, spiritual, cultural, and artistic connections. Thank you. Thank you, Heriberto. Thank you for this very thoughtful um, intervention. I think that uh, um, we have concluded with the, with the panelists. And I was looking also the chat in the Patable, and I see that there is quite an educated conversation among the, the, the participants, uh, uh, the audience, about uh, the different aspects that, uh, that these sessions has uh, highlighted. In particular, there is one, and I, I'm, I'm, I would like maybe, um, going to a very fast round of questions. Um, I don't know if we have time, actually, we have just one minute. Wow, one minute, and then we have the conclusions. 
one or couple of two minutes. All right. Um, the question is from Richard Elman um, to the panelists. So I need to pick one or maybe to the uh, keynote speaker, to Andrew. Um, as the panelists have clearly demonstrated, artistic expression is a truly powerful means of creating empathy. Is there a danger of such an effective tool being employed for negative propagandistic purposes? Who wants to, to answer these questions? Um, Andrew or Colude or I'm, I'm Nathan? Not, I mean... You are happy to do? Okay. Please go on, I mean, Andrew. It's, it's in the nature of art to persuade people. Um, that's what art does. And the art is not necessarily always a good thing. If art is, art can be used for bad purposes. There's no question of that. And it has been used for bad purposes in a number of times in a number of places. Um, I particularly think of Germany in the 1930s, perhaps. Um, but, uh, you know, we hope, we hope that that won't be the case and that the arguments that have been made from so many different cultures and so many different perspectives you know, what we hope is that is that art can be a force to bring these perspectives together and art can be used to remind us of our common humanity and i think that's what most people want from art today they don't want art to be the mouthpiece for a negative regime or a negative view um, so that would be my response of course it can happen but let's hope let's pray that it doesn't happen Okay, do you want to compliment uh, uh, Kulud? I agree, I think art can be used either way, but in general, um, when it comes to, for example, working with refugee communities, art is often used as a complementary way of dealing, dealing with daily issues and daily struggles. So it has a power that is also, um, has to do with affecting psychological well-being and educational well-being. And these aspects should not hinder us, like the negative fear should not hinder us from working towards using art as an advocacy tool and as a tool of development. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, panelists uh, uh, and speakers, uh, um, um, I would stay with you forever. But unfortunate, unfortunately, um, they are keeping telling me that uh, we, are, we have to close. So I would like to give the floor to my colleague Abu Amani, Director of the Water Division of UNESCO and Secretary of the Intergovernmental Hydrological Program for the concluding remarks. Uh, but before that, I wish to thank uh, our great audience. Uh, uh, please read the, the chat, it's, it's, really, it's really nice. I thank my great companion of journey, Andrew Graham Dixon for sharing his wisdom on art and all the wonderful panelists for the insightful perspective and original views. Thank you very much. And Abu, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Michaela. And also I would like to thank all the panelists, the of course, the, the participant uh, is not so easy to summarize uh, the various discussions, but I was able to capture some words uh, like compassion, heritage, heart, artifact, ethics, painting, our water diplomacy, living heritage of water, water culture. So we have all of many of those terms. I think the most important exciting thing here is that really this session helped us to highlight all the intangible values of water because uh, generally when we say value of water we're looking at for economic value financial value infrastructure value but there is a very rich potential of the value of water which is intangible and this session really helped us to understand that and to see how best we can make it used to contribute also to the movement of uh the new relationship between human and water. Because we truly believe that with UNESCO, we need to bring together to reconnect human and nature. And water is part of that movement. And in that sense, uh, we uh, are committed within UNESCO, as you know, within UNESCO, we have, uh, we have also the culture sector and uh, e-commerce uh, is part of uh, all the the process within the nomination of the site. And we are really committed to work closely 
together with the uh, with our culture sector so that we can have a the dialogue of culture art and science towards sustainable solutions for current and future generation and this is very very important aspect really and i'm really pleased to see that uh, this is uh, uh, we have this movement from e-commerce to see to what extent the issue of culture could be considered within the UN Water Conference 2023. And I'm, I'm, we, are, we are ready to work with you to, to move things forward. And also we have all the issues related to gender. Um, yesterday we have a session on that. And all those need to be uh, brought up to the UN Water Conference 2023 to, to, to clearly indicate that Water is not only the issue of engineers. Water is the issue of everybody. And we need to have that movement of water culture so that everybody uh, can consider water not for granted because so far people have been considering water for granted. And we believe that this kind of session are very, very, uh, very, very important. So my, my last word uh, will be because I saw that we, have all, uh, we are already at the end of the timing. And just to assure you of the commitment of, of UNESCO, and within the UNESCO IHP, uh, the Intergovernmental Hydrological Program, and also through WAP, our uh, other uh, program, uh, World Water Assessment Program, uh, we'll work together to mobilize all the energy so that really we can improve the water culture for a better uh, water management so that everybody can take care of water so that we can all together contribute to achieve the SDGs and also to have a peaceful society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Arrivederci tutti. I, I, drink, <laughs> I drink to you with my last water. <laughs> Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. You. you were great. <laughs> Alla prossima. Alla prossima.